Good afternoon. We will start in just one moment. Um, thank you for joining us for the forecast of public health for 2022. Fisher faculty talking with Dr. Michael Mendoza. Again, we'll just start in one moment. Okay, thank you so much for coming to our uh, webinar today. Again, it's a forecast of our public health for 2022, some lessons learned perhaps from the current pandemic, and I am um, happy to announce who is here with us today. Stephanie, can you advance to the next slide? Thank you. So today we have Dr. Michael Mendoza, Commissioner of Public Health for Monroe County. We have Dr. Ashley Holub, who's an instructor here at St. John Fisher College. And we're also joined by Professor Gregory Soner, who also teaches in our public health programs here at the college. Next slide, please, Stephanie. So today what we're going to do is hear from our panelists on some questions that were submitted. And we will also open it up for questions and answers um, more towards the end of this program. And so please do feel free to put your questions right in that chat box for the host and panelists. So why don't we start off today with thinking about the current situation. So we know the Omicron variant is now here in the States. And so a question for the panel is how do you view that current booster scenario and do you think moving forward that this is going to become more like the yearly flu shot that we need to get to try to protect against the newest strain? So whoever would like to take this question. So I guess I'll start. First of all, thank you, uh, Heather, and uh, to all of the Fisher College and the Department of Public Health for uh, hosting this panel today and for inviting me. I'm happy to be here and do what I can uh, to share what's going on. Um, the challenge, of course, is that nobody has a crystal ball, and those of us uh, who try to predict it um, often find that things change so rapidly that uh, it's really very hard uh, to know. But um, I think it's worth uh, underscoring what we do know um, and recognize that things may change. But, but currently, uh, as, as many people know, Omicron has been uh, isolated in New York State uh, from what we are learning in the literature, uh, primarily looking at literature that's world, worldwide. Uh, it appears that Omicron is far more transmissible, much more contagious than the Delta variant, um, but it does not appear to be as dangerous from a lethality or severity standpoint. Um, of course, a lot of that is subject to change. Uh, there's still a lot that we're learning, but the initial um, signals are that it is more transmissible, but less serious from the standpoint of causing illness. So we can expect more cases and hopefully fewer hospitalizations now. Hospitalizations, as you all know, is, is really the major focus right now. And um, I'm in the hospital at, 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 uh, at the moment and uh, taking care of a lot of patients who uh, really are unable to leave the hospital because we're experiencing a, back, experiencing a backlog with uh, long-term care and other post-acute facilities. So um, we really do need to focus on the hospitalizations right now. Um, but looking ahead, uh, what I can tell you is that the booster shot is going to become very critical. Uh, of the patients that I've admitted to the hospital with COVID, um, all, well, all of them at the moment are unvaccinated, uh, but early in their week, I had one individual who was vaccinated, but eligible for his booster and did not get it. So he, uh, his course essentially paralleled that of those who were unvaccinated. So I can't underscore enough the importance of getting uh, your booster shot when you are eligible, because there's good evidence now that the uh, Pfizer and Moderna vac vaccines uh, begin to lose some of their efficacy with re regard to preventing serious illness. Um, they certainly do uh, reduce uh, their efficacy with regard to preventing cases, but that's not exactly what we're primarily concerned with. We're really looking at the hospitalization. So there is some evidence that there is declining uh, immunity from both natural infection from having had COVID, as well as from the um, vaccine-induced immunity. So as to whether it will become like the flu shot really is dependent upon all of us. 
um, you know, to the extent that we can maximally vaccinate and or immunize our community, um, that will in some degree dictate how things go here in the United States. Um, but with this global pandemic, it is global for a reason. And we're not out of, out of this until we're all out of this. And so depending on what happens across the globe, that will also determine how this looks going forward. At, at, at some point, we're going to be looking at, at corona or the, the COVID-19 virus as being endemic. It'll be like influenza. We deal with it every year. Um, what variant of that is uh, to be determined? Um, but it's not unreasonable to think that if we can't vaccinate the entire global population adequately, that we'll be looking at uh, annual uh, booster shots. Um, it's important to recognize that the flu shot is not a, actually a booster shot because um, it's a different vaccine every year. Uh, currently, what we're offering uh, with regard to the COVID-19 uh, vaccines are technically boosters because you're getting the same thing that you got the first two times. Um, so if there is a new uh, Omicron specific uh, COVID vaccine uh, that's different from the current ones, it remains to be seen. And what happens next year is, is really anybody's guess at this point. Yeah, and I just want to echo some of your thoughts regarding vaccine equity across the globe. So we don't get out of this until everybody gets out of this. So, you know, a few countries having really good vaccine uptake is not going to get us in the same spot as if everybody has vaccine uptake. And that's really, really important because the more unvaccinated individuals there are, the more chances that this thing can mutate. So that vaccine equity on a global scale is really, really important. And like Dr. Mendoza stated, I think a lot of what's going to come really depends on how well we're able to get that vaccine equity. So those efforts really do need to be targeted to getting vaccines to areas that do not have the same level of access or even uptake at the moment. And we saw that even in South Africa, uptake in general just wasn't good. Access was there, but the uptake was not. So we need to examine those gaps and how do we get that rollout going a little bit smoother, getting people to trust in the science, in terms of how I view the current booster scenario, I think there's still a lot to be seen. And again, this is a very rapidly evolving situation. Um, the booster data now at this point looks really good. So once you're eligible, please do get boosted. And I know, again, I'm echoing a lot of what was said previously, but it does give you that extra boost in, in um, antigens. And that's what we wanna see. In terms of whether or not we have that neutralizing, um, the, the sterilizing um, neutralizing effect, I think it's believed that because of that boost, we can get there. Um, however, again, that data is still, be, to, still to be seen and we don't fully know yet. But that being said, you wanna get the most level of protection that you can get and that booster will give you more. Um, so once you're eligible, don't hesitate, get your appointment and go. Do I think that this is going to become an every year vaccine? I personally am still on the fence just based on the lack of data and what's currently existing. It's possible that maybe with some tweaks, particularly with the mRNA vaccines, maybe we can work out a lifetime vaccine or something with the bigger space. I say that as a giant caveat because I don't know. Um, this is a new situation and things can change every day. If it does turn out to be a yearly vaccine, I personally don't care, that's great. I get my flu shot every year. If it means I'm protected, I'm protected. Um, and certainly that reduction in hospitalizations that we saw come down during the first round of vaccinations, right when Delta was coming in, um, I think speaks volumes for itself because Delta is so transmissible and it was so new and we still managed to keep a hold on the hospitalizations for a good amount of time. So let's keep that going. It's been a good effort. Um, and I think the vaccines have done a phenomenal job. I have no complaints there. Thank you, Dr. Holub and Dr. Mendoza. Professor Soner, did you have anything to add to this particular question? Well, I, I would just uh, go on the simple side because, uh, you know, there's so much information out there and there's so much confusion. And I like the simple messaging. I know the county has been very good at this. I think our governor has been good at this. No, no matter what variants are out there or what new information is out there about tweaks and new treatments and uh, whatnot, new variants, uh, we need to keep pounding away, uh, get vaccinated, get your booster, wear a mask in crowded situations, get tested if you don't feel well, um, because it's pretty much true no matter what. <laughs> and uh, we, we can't get confused by um, breaking news around variants and treatments and, uh, and such, because I think it just confuses the general population. So we need to pound away at the at the simple, consistent messaging about getting vaccinated, getting a booster, 
wearing a mask, getting tested if you don't feel well, et cetera. So I think simple, consistent messaging is really, really important to get us through this. Thank you, Professor Soner. Our next question, which I will direct uh, right to Dr. Mendoza, is what initiatives um, are the county looking at to improve upon in regards to COVID-19? Well, you know, from my standpoint, everything. Uh, there is just not enough. I, I feel like we can always do more. Um, yeah, that being said, I think uh, we're ahead of the game with regard to a number of our initiatives. Uh, number one is testing. Uh, later today, you'll see that we'll be announcing a, a very substantial testing initiative here in Monroe County, uh, where we are uh, planning to distribute free of charge to municipalities and schools approximately 750,000 uh, test kits now. The details for how and when and all of that are, are uh, uh, going to be announced later on today. But what we're really trying to do is flood the community with rapid test kits uh, with the hope that people will use them appropriately and make smart decisions uh, when they decide about upcoming gatherings and holidays and uh, visitors and so forth. Um, with the Omicron variant suspected to cause more cases but fewer uh, illness, serious illnesses, I think it's important for people to be able to have the capacity to test at home. So I view this as uh, just the tip of the iceberg and, and I'm looking to get even more supplies to share with the community in the coming weeks and months. Um, the challenge of course is that the supply chain is actually very, very dry at the moment. So we were quite lucky in getting what we were able to get. And uh, I'm not going to stop trying until uh, we uh, don't have to try anymore. So testing I think is going to be one of those areas uh, where there's always room for improvement, not only in terms of getting the supplies out there, but in providing education to the community about how to use these tests, when to use these tests, how not to use these tests, so that people are using them appropriately. Um, the extent to which we utilize these tests to facilitate uh, children going to school and staying in school uh, is, a, I think, an area where we're uh, doing relatively well compared to a number of our counties. Um, here in Monroe County, I've taken the approach of quarantining uh, fewer students in the schools and using more stringent criteria to quarantine. Um, and it's turning out that that is, has been a, a wise choice. I think uh, we are not seeing any really strong evidence of transmission in our schools, and uh, we're not quarantining as many uh, uh, students per case as other counties are. So uh, we have the luxury of a very, very cooperative superintendent group, and I think parent, the parent community in general has been very, very supportive, so I think that, that helps. Um, but, uh, but I do think that our testing in schools is, again, going to be an area that we have to continue to work on because as we see more cases, and particularly as we get into children, which will be our next question, um, we'll have to think more about how do we utilize and uh, interpret these uh, tests in, in our kids. Um, obviously, the vaccine is um, important, uh, really trying to uh, boost our, literally, our attention on boosters. Um, the the point to remember here is that while we step up our, our efforts around the boosters, we can't forget about the people who haven't even gotten their first series yet. And as I mentioned earlier, all of the patients I'm seeing in the hospital were unvaccinated, never got a vaccine. Uh, and they all universally tell me now they wish they had. Um, and uh, and again, we'll get into this in a little bit, but um, the vac I, I, just can't under, uh, I, I just can't underscore enough how important this vaccine is. And uh, we have more work to do uh, reaching into the zip code. Some zip codes have north of 95% of their population eligible having gotten their first vaccine. And then we've got some zip codes, particularly on the west side of the county and some in the city where that rate is only in the 70%. Um, you know, there really is no good uh, reason at this point to have a 20% sway uh, within a county that is ostensibly served by all of the same resources. So we've got more work to do in that department. I, I, in, and if you look at the data on the dashboard, it, it bears out that we're seeing more hospitalizations in those zip codes where there is a lower uh, vaccine rate per capita. So we've got more work to do on the vaccine front. Um, and then I think you know, where I'm looking ahead is um, you know, how do we change the conversation around health and science? Um, you know, this pandemic didn't have to get as polarized as it did. And this is not limited to Monroe County. This is a, a, a national, a global phenomenon. But um, you know, how do we return to uh, talking about health and science? And I think that's something that has to start now. You know, we're not going to get out of this pandemic if we uh, talk about risk in terms of blacks and whites. I mean, uh, risk is not a black and white issue. It's it's a lot of gray, and we've got to educate the public 
to start to make wise decisions. Because at some point, when we no longer do isolation and quarantine, uh, we're going to let go of the reins and the public will have to make the right choices on their own. And that's what I want. I don't want to have, we, none of us wants to have to do the isolation and quarantining of a pandemic, uh, you know, permanently. So that's a conversation that we really do have to start. And as I think through my messaging now, um, that is, that is to, to a large degree, the end game that I'm trying to, to, to work toward. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Mendoza. Um, so as Dr. Mendoza kind of previewed, the next question on the slide is really thinking about how, how can we view the possible differences um, within different generations for COVID-19? And I think a lot of the attention has been on children, particularly because of the closing of schools or switching to online. And then the follow-up question for that is how will the next generation be different because of the current pandemic? And I would open this to anyone on the panel. Well, you know, the um, you probably saw the Surgeon General's re special report coming out on mental health and and youth. Uh, so I think that's an enormous problem, which has been um, certainly ex exacerbated by COVID, but not created by COVID. And kind of some of the foundational issues there are our access to services, workforce. You know, has always been a problem getting. Uh, people who specialize in children and adolescent uh, delivery. So uh, I, I'm concerned about that. I don't know what to think about predicting the future, uh, but, um, you know, those are fundamental issues that, that we have to systemically address in terms of getting the capacity up to, to serve uh, youth and adolescents. And I, I mean, I feel on the a positive side, People, younger people seem to be open to talking and uh, about mental health and, and about um, issues like that more so than my generation was at the time. So maybe there's an opportunity to, as we've talked about with COVID-19, some I use COVID, the COVID experience as a springboard to, to really improve that overall system of care. Um, and I would say just, just in class with Fisher students have been really impressed with, with their resilience, um, although also concerned. They've been through a lot with, with um, you know, masking and shutdowns and Zooming and such that, that I'm impressed with their resilience, but also concerned about some of the impact this may, may have on them going forward. It, it takes a toll. We only, all of us only have so much of a reservoir of strength and resources. So. So it's just an overall general concern, like how are we going to build services that have generally been overtaxed anyway? Are we gonna have the political will uh, to, to get resources where we need to get them in our, in our schools, in our CBOs, in our hospital systems? I don't know the answer to that, but I think the Surgeon General's report is, is something we could really focus on and, and, and use uh, for some direction and pointing resources to, to youth and adolescents. Yeah, and I'll go off of that. So I don't have a direct good answer to this. I think a lot of this really boils down to the concerns highlighted. We're concerned about their mental health and well being, how it's going to affect them down the road. I don't think anybody really knows what that looks like. Um, I do want to echo just some thoughts from pediatrics field in general. Um, pediatricians are feeling very overwhelmed and swamped. So I think in that sense, the system has not really prepared them to deal with anything of this nature. And naturally, the system was not really built to deal with anything of this nature. But looking at the pediatric vaccine rollout, for example, putting those vaccines in clinics is a really great idea because there's an established rapport with the pediatricians, but a lot of them said that they just can't keep up with the volume. Um, so I think there's a very real concern that we want to get people vaccinated and we want people to feel happy and safe, um, but also how do we balance getting people vaccinated at the clinic with also having them still attend for their well -check? Back. During COVID, we saw that there was actually a drop in other vaccines and well visits and things of that nature for pediatrics because people weren't going to the doctors. Um, and that was happening to adults too. A lot of adults were falling behind on their care. But again, thinking about what are these sort of long-term effects from the short-term or current state of where we are. 
Um, and I'll just add, you know, and there, we could talk an hour about all of the impacts that this has had on the different generations. But from the from the COVID illness standpoint, uh, particularly around children, I've I've always been very dismayed by this notion that somehow childhood infections are are somehow trivial, uh, that not very many children get sick, and therefore it's okay to allow some. The, this is a preventable infection. Uh, you know, yes, people do get the common cold, and you know we do what we can to prevent that. Uh, and this is not the common cold. Uh, people who get COVID of, of any age put themselves at risk for a whole host of things. And um, you know we don't talk about that very much, and and perhaps for good reason. But uh, I do think the public needs to understand that even though the vast majority of kids do just fine, there are a small number of kids who do not do fine. And if you're a parent of one of those kids who does not do fine. Uh, all those uh, those generalizations about trivializing this illness really don't mean very much to you because you're dealing with a child who didn't need to be sick, who is very ill. So I, I do think that, um, you know, when you're dealing with a preventable infection, um, you know, we'd love to say zero infections is a goal. That's not realistic, but I, I don't personally think that any of these infections should be considered, uh, you know, acceptable because I do think that we can prevent them. Now, outside of the realm of the infection itself, um, you know, my colleagues have talked about this, the impact that this, uh, this COVID pandemic has had on the younger generation will take a generation to unpack, you know, with uh, regard to the long-term studies on the biological impacts of COVID uh, infection, uh, with the impact that this has had on uh, interruption of school, and uh, from our youth risk behavior survey uh, study data here in Monroe County, we know that when kids are taken out of school, particularly vulnerable children who have experienced adverse childhood events in their lives. Uh, when you take away non-parental adults with whom they can confide, when you take away a feeling of connection to the community, when you take away uh, this thought that they can contribute to the community, we know that they have a higher incidence of substance abuse, uh, mental illness, uh, suicidality, uh, and a whole host of other issues. So it's going to take some time to understand that. Um, thankfully, in this community, I think we've done uh, a reasonable job, but particularly recently in thinking through how uh, we're a trauma-informed community, and we have a long way to go. We've got to do a lot more in that regard because there's a lot more trauma, uh, unfortunately, as a result of this pandemic. Um, and then when we look to the older generations, I think, um, you know, unfortunately, this is a generation that has uh, seen a, a disproportionate drop in life expectancy. Um, it's going to take a while to un understand what that is. Now, it's not all COVID, uh, the opioid epidemic is, has been the largest reason for the drop in uh, life expectancy until last year. But um, not since World War II have we seen more than two years consecutively of uh, decline in life expectancy. And we're looking at four years and counting right now. So this is a generational thing that we're going to have to, to understand. And I do think, again, going to my previous point, as we get out of this pandemic, you know, all generations are going to have to figure out um, how do they talk about health and science. I mean, our teenagers now will... Uh, remember, you know, they are going to be the COVID generation, much in the same way that, you know, those who lived 9-11 uh, at a particular time in their life, we all remember where we were uh, through 9-11. So I think this is going to have an indelible impact uh, on children um, and our generation. So and it will take a while to understand. Thank you all for your comments on this. And I can speak just from the young adult, late adolescence population. You know, we're seeing a lot of those mental health concerns with substance abuse and suicidality um, right in our undergraduate population here. So I think it's really important that we continue working on this. Stephanie, can you advance to the thank you? <laughs> so our next question is, as we move into 2022, what do you see happening with various applications of telehealth? Um, and so will the technology expand um, and are there, or what are the implications for access and outcomes? And I would open this to anyone on the panel. Well, I, I, I brought this one up and I was interested in what other people thought and especially Dr. Mendoza, but it's, it's been an issue for a long time now in my, in my area, behavioral health to, to you know, extend uh, telehealth to to people as an option, you know, for substance abuse treatment, and mental health treatment, and even access to, you know, primary care and specialty care for people who have uh, challenges to for transportation or even just social challenges to to get out into doctors' offices. and And it's been it's it's really been, uh, it's the right word. I think resisted by funders 
and regulators. Um, and, be, you know, uh, because of the necessity with COVID, uh, telehealth has been opened up and, and I feel it's really helped uh, access. Um, and I hope it continues. Now, I think the question will be if and when things settle down, will, will funders and regulators pull back on, on um, allowing uh, telehealth visits and having a reasonable um, reimbursement for those things? And, and again, my, my focus is more on really primary access to primary care and behavioral health. But I'm just curious what other people might think, because I, I think it's a great it's a great tool. It's not for everybody, but I really think it, it's um, proven to improve access um, for a lot of folks in rural areas or have transportation or social restrictions to accessing care. Yeah, so my general view on this is I agree from the start, I think the telehealth approach was really focused on those rural areas. And certainly that's where a lot of the funding behind this was coming from prior to COVID. Um, when I say a lot of funding, obviously rural funding is not as great as it should be, and it's not doing a great job at expanding access. There's actually still parts of the country that don't have internet um, because they are so rural. I used to work with a coworker who told me he lived in an area that when they got telehealth, it was brought in because they basically parked a bus that had a satellite on it so that they can connect. Um, so this is as new as it is. Um, we still have a, a long way to go. And I know that it seems like it's kind of blown up overnight and, and part of that is due to COVID. Um, I will say that I think when I used to work in venture capital, a lot of the telehealth pitches that we saw were platforms that were really well thought through, had thought through the privacy issues, but all of the hangups and in terms of being able to get investment money were around that regulation piece. So what do we do when you're a patient over state lines and your providers over here? Who's going to pay for this? Is it insurance? Is it going to a central review authority if you have some sort of test from a home kit or something? Who's going to contact the patient? Um, COVID has really forced the hand on a lot of this and I think has forced us to just figure it out as we go. And, and I think in a lot of ways, that's actually been a good thing because it, we would still be kind of like dinosaurs slugging towards this without it, um, which is great because now it means that the rural access can be expanded. I see a lot of other implications for this, um, education as well, right? So if kids need access to school and they can't necessarily get there for whatever reason, maybe it's a transportation issue. There's just a lot of other implications here that I'm excited to see. Um, and I think in terms of implications, I don't necessarily think we need to do away with in-person options. I think different options work well for different people. Um, and so that needs to be considered as well too. So I, I think we've been doing telemedicine in sort of its you know, infancy for many, many years uh, when the electronic medical records really became in vogue uh, in this community in the early 2000 teens. Um, we had my chart, we had ways for our patients to contact us and that was a primitive form of telehealth. Uh, what it boiled down to was asynchronous communication. So before it was very much either telephone or in person, which meant that both parties had to be free in order to communicate at the same time. But with the EMR, we now allow essentially what amount to text messages and emails. So that allows for that asynchronous communication, which allows uh, people to communicate more, uh, you know, more efficiently in, in some re regards. Um, you know, when we think of telemedicine, uh, and particularly with the, the birth of telemedicine as a result of COVID, uh, what we saw was a huge increase, largely driven by necessity, of uh, telemedicine face-to-face -face visits. And I think most of us had wanted that all along, and the primary limitation to that was reimbursement. Uh, reimbursement was really non-existent for most telemedicine types of, of visits, and, and uh, so most practices couldn't afford to do it, even though we all kind of had the sense that it would be a lot more efficient, um, and that's what you know a lot of the early studies are showing. And I'll tell you anecdotally from my experience, you know, if I'm seeing a patient that I've known for many, many years and we're just making some adjustments on medications, I don't actually see, need to see them face to face. I mean, I am perfectly happy building a rapport because I know who they are and, and we could do it by telemedicine. And in a, in a 10 minute visit, we can accomplish everything that we would have done in a 15 or 20 minute visit in the office without the additional burden of uh, the transportation, all of those kinds of things. Um, and I will also observe, and I think this has been shown in some of the early literatures as well, that um, mental health visits, access to mental health visits has increased in some uh, respects um, because uh, no-show rates are better uh, when the client doesn't have to get out of their house and uh, overcome what barriers they have to overcome to get into the office to see their provider face-to-face. -face. Um, and so I've noticed for my own practice that my patients for whom I 
have scheduled a mental health type visit, uh, they're much more engaged because for better or worse, they don't have to change and get out of their house. They can, you know, have their interaction with me from the comfort of their, you know, their, their living room. So I think there are things that we need to study. We need to understand the limitations of telemedicine. There's certainly going to be times when telemedicine is inappropriate. Um, but I think we just need to challenge ourselves to find out what are the interactions where telemedicine is either appropriate or ideal. Uh, and I think uh, the, the, the sky's the limit on this, really. And, and the limitation primarily is the funding. How do we make this an acceptable business model uh, while improving access to care? Um, you know, when you look at just primary medical care alone, there's no question that we in primary care actually need to take care of more patients, not fewer. Uh, we have a huge shortage of primary care in this, in this country, and we're not going to address that shortage if we only look at face-to-face -face visits as the only currency of, of healthcare delivery. So how do we deliver healthcare in these non-traditional ways that may in fact be even uh, better in terms of quality? Thank you all. Um, and I know I am on the board of directors for the Healing Connection, which is an eating disorder clinic. And throughout the pandemic, the amount of no-shows decreased to zero and the uptake in kept appointments was amazing. And so that was a lot of it was not having to get dressed and, and go to the clinic. So hopefully we'll continue to expand those services. Our next question is how will the workforce develop in the new year? given challenges of pay, stress, and capacity demands of the health providers. Well, uh, you know, I think Dr. Mendoza touched on it from a primary care standpoint. And, you know, I've been on so many workforce commissions over the years um, uh, that come up with the same conclusion, you know, People don't make enough, there's just too stressful and um, the uh, demand exceeds the capacity. And these reports go off to Albany or Washington and nothing seems to change. <laughs> so it, it's, a, it's a big question, but again, what's the COVID impact moving into uh, the new year? Um, certainly the stressors are significant and the challenges are significant, but I do think there's some opportunity with, we're seeing pay move a bit. Uh, we're seeing dollars um, free up and flow into some of these um, underfunded, you know, traditionally underfunded service areas. Um, hopefully that will continue um, and it'll be stable uh, funding. Uh, and I hope that people are motivated to look into different careers, you know, given the challenges we see, you know, all of us personally, you know, whether it's with kids or at work um, or, or other family members and be motivated to say, hey, you know, uh, this is something I would like to get involved, you know, public health in general or some specific, especially area. So, so I feel like there's a little opportunity to, to build on this in the coming year through, through advocacy and through education in our community for workforce development. I mean, we're always hearing about workforce development initiatives in the, the business sector and the manufacturing sector, but I think we need a big a mobilization for um, outreach to the community for um, career opportunities in public health. And, um, you know, again, maybe the crisis of COVID uh, people's awareness of the importance of health, public health, different kind of specialty services will motivate um, folks to, to think about new careers and, and of course, um, get into the Masters of Public Health program or other programs uh, in the community. So, so it's a chronic problem. It, it, the, the foundational weaknesses have been laid bare uh, with COVID. And I think the time for action is now. And it's, I think, advocacy and education and outreach to, to get people into the field. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll add that we've got a number of problems. Uh, you know, to borrow from medical lingo, we've got an acute on chronic problem. Uh, and the acute problem is that we've got a pretty significant workforce shortage right now that's impacting our ability to have throughput through the hospitals and all the various stages of care. Um, and we're working very hard to address those issues, uh, you know, with the discharge from hospital to 
uh, nursing facilities or assisted living or what have you, that's, that's a bottleneck right now that we need to deploy acute solutions to fix very urgently. Um, <clears throat> the risk that we undertake in addressing that acute urgency are a few. Number one is that we think that the acute solution is the chronic solution. And I think from most uh, experiences that we've all gleaned, although we haven't learned very much from them, um, I think we should know and should learn that the acute solution is not necessarily going to be the right solution for the long-term thing, because the long-term thing is really more about prevention rather than trying to you know, stick your finger in the dike everywhere there's a leak. Um, so right now we're looking at trying to deploy National Guard. As you've learned about in the news, we have New York National Guard uh, coming to the rescue, helping us at Mineral Community Hospital take care of a number of patients who are being discharged from the hospital. And, and that's going to be a partial solution to a very substantial acute problem. Uh, we're looking to scale that up. We're looking for other you know, creative solutions. Um, but when this uh, dies back, when the, when the acute surge dies back, um, you know, we'll still have to do a lot of work to uh, overcome sort of the post-acute phase. You know? So let's say we, we are able to you know, loosen up the bottleneck for uh, hospital discharges. You know, we're still going to have this influx of people who didn't get their care in December because of the delay in procedures and so forth. So we're gonna to have to figure out that part, but that's, that's not a chronic problem either. Hopefully they, uh, we're not gonna be doing that on a frequent basis. But then once, once we get beyond all of this, um, we need to look at prevention. And uh, we have the most expensive healthcare system on the planet. The solution to that problem is not to hire more expensive professionals. Um, do we need more doctors? Yes. Do we need to deploy them better? Definitely yes. Uh, the distribution of doctors in this country is more the problem than the number of doctors. Um, and we definitely need more primary care doctors. The, the number of primary care doctors we have per capita uh, compared to other industrial nations, industrialized nations who have better health outcomes, uh, you know, for us here in the United States is, is really pretty abysmal. Um, but the, at the end of the day, I do think that we all need to work harder. And I, I say that with a lot of distress because I think we're all working hard right now, but the problem is that we're not working smart. You know, there are a lot of opportunities that I can tell you about in my own practice where I spend hours on the phone filling out paperwork, which is not really a very good use of a physician's time. And when you look at the system and how much it reimburses physicians, that's a huge waste because not only is it a waste of my time, it's taking away from my time to be able to be a doctor for somebody else because I'm being a secretary at the same time. So those are the kinds of issues that we need to address because at the end of the day, um, you know, we need to come home and say that my job was meaningful. Everybody wants to come home at the end of the day and say that their job was meaningful. And we don't generally derive meaning unless we have connections, uh, meaningful connections with you know, patients, clients, colleagues, um, and that we're working to the top of our training. Uh, that I think is what people want to do. That's why people go in and get additional training. It's not so that they can uh, sit back and, and take it easy. I think people generally wanna get additional training and skills so that they can use those skills and better themselves. Um, but that's going to take a long time to unpack. And uh, I think if, as, as Greg had said, that the, the COVID pandemic has really laid bare a lot of the cracks that we've had in the system for a long, long time. Thank you both for those responses. And our next question, I believe we, we did touch upon a little bit with the initiatives for the County Health Department, as well as talking about the booster scenario. But I'm looking just for some additional thoughts as variants continue to rise. How does the county health team decide and communicate best precautions before we really have data to understand the variants? And then the follow up for that is, you know, to what extent does public perception factor into those precautions? I know uh, people are sick of masking, but we know it works. Um, so Dr. Mendoza, do you have any thoughts on that? I think a lot of it is perception. Um, and I, you know, perception isn't arbitrary. Per perception can be shaped. And I think that's our job in the health department and more broadly in the community. Um, but as we've done many times already, you know, we're dealing with uncertainty and being honest and transparent about what we know and what we don't know, I think is reassuring. Uh, I, I've never wanted to uh, get out ahead of the data. And, you know, my job is to reflect as best as we know what we're seeing in the evidence. And if there is no good evidence, then I'm perfectly comfortable saying we just don't know yet. Uh, and this is what we need to wait in order to see, in order to be able to say what we do know. Um, you know and with these variants, you know, we are doing some testing locally. Uh, Wadsworth Lab in Albany is also doing the same. Obviously the CDC is doing the same. The predominant variant right now is 100% Delta. 
roughly 100%. I mean, there's a small proportion of uh, Omicron, and there may be some Omicron even in the region, um, but it's not by any stretch causing uh, any major surges in uh, outbreaks or hospitalizations. Um, but, uh, you know, at some level, we've got to shape public perception, and we've got to have a way for people to have that conversation so that they're not getting their facts and evidence uh, from the University of Facebook. That's not where we want people to get their information. And unfortunately, uh, this has come down to this very polarized debate that is just not helpful. Um, and so how we shape public perception has been the challenge from the start. I can tell you that there are many opportunities that I wish I would have had back to do over again, starting with masks in April of last year when the CDC and all of us said, you know, we want to save the N95s for the healthcare workers, you know, and we wanted to save masks in general for, you know, that, that, that didn't help us. And so a lot of lessons that we've learned here, but, you know, for those who say, well, back in April of 2020, you said this, you know, this has changed, you know, countless times in that uh, almost two years. And for people who are so rooted in the facts of April, 2020, you know, that's not how you get out of a pandemic. We've, we've got to be thinking and working together and using what we know right now and, and recognize that things can change on the turn of a dime. Excellent, thank you. Stephanie, if you go to the next slide, um, I'm gonna skip the first question on here real quick because I think this goes beautifully into the last question is thinking of these last two questions here. So do you think the past year has changed how the public views their own health and healthcare? And do you think overall that people are starting to look for ways to be proactive on their health and why or why not? I will open this to anyone. I was just saying the public is kind of a slippery, uh, slippery slope there. Because as we know, there's a lot of publics and a lot of um, subsections. We have urban and rural divides, urban, rural, suburban. We have... Um, political divides, age divides, educational divides, et cetera. So, so, I mean, I think one of the things back to what Dr. Mendoza said earlier is like, you know, we have to be smart about communications and we have to be smart about understanding the public where it's not sort of this big whole public. And as we, you know, we like to think about pop health and we like to think about targeting, um, uh, uh, interventions, we also need to think about targeting messaging and understanding the subsets of publics. Um, so, I mean, my, so the only way I could answer that is to say, well, which public and, you know, which public do we want to talk about? Um, and, and let's get smarter about targeting messages to specific subsets of, of our community um, so they can be more effective. Yeah, that's a tough question to answer. Um, and honestly, I would be interested in seeing any studies. I haven't been able to read a ton on this in terms of how the public currently views things. I know one of the things I was interested in prior to the pandemic is actually how the public views science and scientists. Um, immediately before the pandemic, it was a pretty favorable rating. People generally trusted something about 80 to 90% did believe science, they believed in science, they trusted scientists, they associated them with trustworthy sources. Um, I would be interested to see that study redone now and see, you know, what is sort of the take. I think one of the biggest things that's been tough is just communicating that part around that things change. Um, we're not flip-flopping because we're trying to trick you and we're not flip-flopping because we're unknowledgeable or don't know. Um, there's been obviously working with a novel pandemic means that there is not always the information we need available to make the right decision out of the gate. And like Dr. Mendoza highlighted, that decision early on to tell the public not to wear masks is a really good example. Um, we just thought that they wouldn't work based on prior studies and, and further the biggest reason was out of need. There was a supply shortage and we needed the healthcare workers to have those masks. Does it mean that we couldn't have told the public as early on as end of April or May to wear a face made a home covering? Certainly, but again, we just didn't know. And as soon as we did know, as soon as we had some inkling, we changed our mind and that's a good thing. So just kind of expressing the idea that if we're changing our mind, it's, it's a good thing. It means we've reviewed some update and data and we're a little bit more comfortable making that change because it's based on something. Um, it's not because we're, we're sort of out to get you. Um, and I think for the public, that's been a hard thing to rectify that changes and, and sort of these sudden updates are actually a very necessary part of doing the work. 
Yeah, not much more to add here, except to say that, yeah, I, I think absolutely the public has changed uh, how they view uh, their health and healthcare. As Greg said, there are many, many ways to look at the public. Um, what I, I think we need to anticipate is that people will continue to change how they think about health and healthcare for the balance of this pandemic. And I think we have an opportunity even during this pandemic to shape the outcome of where everybody settles. Um, you know, many people had said, well, why are you, you know, trying to spend all of this time and effort in various uh, populations and zip codes where the vaccine rates are lower? Aren't, aren't these people basically just set? They're not going to get their vaccine and nothing you say or do is going to change their minds. Well, the reality is that for the last couple of months until the last uh, week or two, you know, we've been doing this slow increase of thousands of vaccines every day. And it's not the giant you know, mass vaccine sites that we had at the, at the Joe Marine or at the convention center. But a lot of people have been, and if you look at the data, you know, thousands of first doses are being administered every week. And I think that's proof that um, people can change their minds. And I think it's important for us to remember that we don't want to give up on these populations because we somehow, you know, came to the erroneous conclusion that people have made up their mind. Um, mm -hmm. People will change their minds. And I think it's our job uh, as scholars and public servants uh, to remember that um, it's not over until it's all over. And uh, I, for one, don't think that uh, uh, there's any reason to quit, even, even around those so-called uh, hard-to-reach populations. Can I, can I say one other thing, uh, Heather? Um, because I do think one of the obvious changes generally has been healthcare and, and general public health in particular has become politicized. And um, so this is kind of new to me uh you know i've been in politically charged situations otherwise like say in, with abortion rights for instance but um to to have masks or vaccines um uh, be um politicized is just uh an unfortunate evolution in in some parts of the public's opinion and i'm i'm just curious to see how it will evolve will it get worse you know, will it spill over into other kinds of public health me measures? You know, certainly guns is an issue. Um, will it uh, affect other kind of mandatory vaccines? I think it's really dangerous around what's happened to the politicization, politicalization of science, I guess, in, in public health. And uh, I don't have any um, uh, predictions about that, but I find it very disturbing uh, how this is, there has always been a small anti-vax movement and uh, it's just exploded um, in the past two years. And uh, it, I, I hope somehow that can be uh, reversed um, in, in, the, in the new year. And maybe as Dr. Mendoza says, I do think people change, you know, we all change our minds. And there's a steady, a steady growth in, in vaccination rates and people getting sick and whatnot. Um, and I hope somehow this, as time goes on, this mitigates the, um, you know, the um, politicization of these issues. Thank you, everyone, which brings us to our final panel question. And then I would like to remind people on this call that they can go ahead and submit questions over chat. Um, but on a positive note, should we expect some sort of renaissance to follow this pandemic? So St. John Fisher did offer a series of lectures about the pandemic that really looked at earlier pandemics and, and saw how societies changed or what those lessons learned. So if we were to jump forward, say 20 years from now, do you think we'll look back and say COVID-19 changed the way we do X, Y, Z, and now things are better? So I would open this up. So I think we're going to certainly see a pretty large change in society where that is exactly, I don't know, but I'll start with the workforce. For example, what's currently going on in workforce, even outside of public health is referred to as the great resignation right now. People are holding their employers to higher standards for their well-being or they're quitting. Um, and that has contributed to some of the labor shortages that we're actually seeing. And I think that that's really forcing employers' hands to do better, don't force people to work excess hours, pay them livable wages. Um, I think actually that's something that's been kind of nice to see that society has finally managed to move the needle in a way that's favorable for them versus the larger corporations. Um, so in some ways you might be able to consider that its own renaissance. I know certainly anybody working in the recruiting fields will say that the market right now is just absolutely wild. Um, 
I think that that's one way that we'll see things. And I think the shift towards better work-life balance, how, how people view their life outside of work and, and wanting to enjoy life in the event they have to go back into another quarantine. Um, I think that that's going to be a change that we'll certainly see. In terms of other aspects, I think just the way people view their interactions with society are likely going to be different, though I am not quite sure what outside of that work-life balance value. Um, but I think you know the most immediate one that's obvious to me is that workplace change. Well, I'm, I'm amazed by the, the biotechnology and the advances in biotechnology and, and just um, what's moving forward even in the current, um, the current science of, of, of vaccines and, and uh, the mRNA, mRNA initiatives. I mean, I just think biotechnology is, is flying forward with advances that are gonna help most of us and has really been stimulated by COVID. You know, we've pulled back on some, maybe some older outdated practices of how quickly or slowly science may move. Um, and I think that might be a good, good change to see more innovation and more change coming to the, the marketplace sooner. Um, I, I, uh, um, and, and I'm not a biotechnology person, but, I do read about it and it just floors me, um, the advances they're making and those, those are gonna help all of us. The th one of the things that concerns me and, and I hope it changes is disparities evolving under COVID, you know, and that we do have a greater awareness of disparities and hopefully that will stimulate um, us to take policy actions and resource allocation actions to to address, again, some of these chronic disparities that have existed in our society for, for decades. So those are two positive things I hope will come from this, the science. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'll just close by saying that if we don't have a renaissance, then we will have missed the largest opportunity of our generation. Uh, it is on all of us to ensure that we have a renaissance that is sustained. Um, the most recent tragedy that we all can remember is 9-11. Uh, and in the wake of 9-11, we saw huge increases in funding, and it came in the way of bioterrorism prevention and uh, public health emergency preparedness. Th those, those were the lingo words that earned public health um, probably the largest infusion of resources in, in 20, 25 years. And, you know, over the, you know, ensuing, you know, 18, 19 years, 20 years, the, the funding has dried up. It has been diverted to other places because I think in public health, we didn't do a good enough job hanging on to those funds. Um, and I think by our nature in public health, we are not showers. We like to do the work and go home and say that the, a good day in, in public health is a day that the public didn't really notice us. And we've got to change that tune because the public needs to know about us. You know, and they need to know that we are responsible for a whole host of things that are very easily taken for granted food, water, air, you know, those are things that we all need and public health plays a role in all of the above. Um, but unfortunately, because we didn't do a good enough job uh, bragging for lack of a better word, uh, funding fell about 11% from 2010 to 2015. And, uh, you know, at the risk of getting political, that was during the golden years of public health. We had a very favorable administration who uh, when given the chance in 2009, to develop an, a national pandemic influenza plan chose not to. And uh, that turned out to be a fortuitous decision uh, because not uh, you know, 11 years later, 10 years later, it would have been nice to have a more structured pandemic uh, flu response across the country. Now here in Monroe County, we have had a pandemic influenza plan for 10, nine years since, 2000, since the H1N1 uh, pandemic. Um, but that has not received nearly as much support at the state or uh, national level. And as you all saw in uh, 2020, even though we had a pandemic flu plan that was tried and true and tested every year at the local health department level, uh, the state health department decided to reinvent everything and do it differently. So we had all sorts of plans on how to distribute vaccine. And then we come to find that the governor's office has decided to reinvent the entire kit and caboodle uh, in the course of two weeks. So having the plans and following them uh, is key. 
But uh, we've got to go beyond that. We've got to protect the funding. We've got to do more to trumpet the successes of public health. And the challenge of that, of course, is showing that what we didn't see was a result of public health. You know, by its very nature, when you prevent something, you don't notice it because you didn't see it. And, and that, is the, that is the conundrum of prevention. Uh, in a country that spends one cent out of every dollar on prevention, um, it's, it's easy to understand why, because it doesn't you know, grab headlines and it's not something that you're going to see. You don't see the invasive dental caries that would have resulted had, had we not had fluoride in the water. Um, and frankly, I don't wanna see those things. Um, but when you take all of the top 10 public health interventions of, of, the, two, of the 2000s, uh, of the 1900s, um, that resulted in a 25-year improvement in life expectancy. And no other chemotherapy or surgery or even aspirin has been able to show that kind of benefit. But we are not very good in public health at talking about our successes. And I think uh, we need to do that if we're going to ensure that we have a, a renaissance in, in the wake of COVID. Dr. Mendoza, thank you so much for those final words on this. Stephanie, you can advance to the next slide. Maybe. <laughs> so as Director of Public Health here at St. John Fisher College, I want to thank my colleagues, Dr. Mendoza, Dr. Holub, and Professor Soner for joining us today to talk a little bit about lessons learned from the pandemic and perhaps what we might be looking at in the next year or so. Um, if you do have any questions about the Master in Public Health program, please uh, feel free to reach out to me. Again, I want to thank all of my colleagues for joining us today. Um, and thank you so much and have a good day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too, Greg. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone.